you know what time it is. Football season, Q4. Time to close out another year of growth and prep for the next year of revenue. To bring in more businesses Q4 and beyond, you need HubSpot Sales Hub. With a smart prospecting workspace, deal management suite, and AI-powered apps, you can take total control of your operation to generate more leads and land more sales. And when you pair a sales hub with other hubs in HubSpot Smart CRM, your team will be on the same page across the entire customer journey. Leads won't slip through the cracks, and data is connected across marketing, sales, and operations, so you can better measure your impact on the bottom line. Stop sticking to the same old strategies and start closing more deals, because the best time to score is Q4. Make the switch to HubSpot Sales Hub at HubSpot.com slash sales. Howdy, folks. It is Tuesday, March 21st. I'm Jacob Cohen here with Rob Litterst, and you're listening to The Hustle Daily Show. Today, we're going to be talking about Netflix's ambitions in gaming, an industry whose revenues wildly outpaced that of Hollywood last year. Before that, though, let's talk about what else is going on in the world of business and tech. Let's get crack All right, JC, what have you been looking at today? Yeah, so the main thing I've been following have been Amazon's plans to lay off another 9,000 employees. This comes after laying off 18,000 employees over the last couple of months. You know, in a note, CEO Andy Jassy used language similar to language we saw Mark Zuckerberg use when he laid off thousands of employees recently. Things like leaner is better. A notable difference, though, from Meta is that Meta's entire business is ads, digital ad markets, taking a huge hit. Right. And Jassy's announcement, you know, he says the cuts are across Amazon Web Services, HR, Twitch, their streaming service that many gamers use, and advertising. So you can't just pin it on a bad ad market. Amazon's got a much wider and broader surface area, I feel like, than Meta as far as different products Mm -hmm. and different services and stuff like that. Amazon, if you look at it, is probably more like 10 companies in one. (laughs) Yeah. So another thing I've been following is some very bad news. (laughs) Normally, rain in California would be a good thing in many ways. But when you have a lot of rain after the driest three-year period in the history of your state, what you get is a lot of flooding. And according to Bloomberg, some of this flooding is threatening harvests of strawberries across California's $3 billion strawberry industry, which is an industry responsible for around 90% of U.S. strawberry production. So not something you want to see, especially when strawberry prices went up almost 9% in 2022 after jumping 41% in 2021. So really the last thing we need here is another strawberry supply problem. Seriously. And the last thing I'm following is some interesting data I've been seeing about AI and tools like ChatGPT making their way into the workplace. I have to say, even as recently as last year, something like using powerful AI models at work was not something on my things you're hiding from your boss bingo card. But (laughs) the truth of the matter is Fishbowl, which is a professional social networking site, surveyed more than 11,000 people and found that 43% of workers have now used tools like ChatGPT for work and that 70% of those are doing so without letting their boss know. The interesting thing to me about this trend is that soon enough, it'll become increasingly difficult to not use tools like ChatGPT in some way, shape or form at work. You know, OpenAI and Microsoft have made a lot of progress getting their tech quite literally into the office, making the tools a central part of the Microsoft Office suite. Some companies have explicitly banned these tools, especially companies on Wall Street, probably for privacy and security reasons. But many companies are very open to these tools. And Microsoft is working with eight Fortune 500 firms on their new AI platforms. And I think we're just going to see increasingly big companies make these tools part of their workplace. So interesting trend there. So AI in the workplace actually dovetails really nicely into one of the first things that I'm looking at, which is PitchBook's VC Exit Predictor. Mm. So This tool is basically an AI tool that tries to predict whether a startup will be acquired, go public, or not have an exit. And the tool was 74% accurate in tests. Okay. There are a few stipulations, though. So to qualify for the tool, a company must have received at least two rounds of venture funding. I guess that's kind of what allows the tool to be somewhat accurate. Otherwise, it would just be a total shot in the dark. Yeah. The other thing here is apparently PitchBook isn't the first company to try this. Crunchbase reportedly built a similar tool. 
it's going to have a really big impact on VCs vetting investments, yeah. which seems to make a lot of sense. I think it does make a lot of sense, although it's kind of interesting because a lot of these VCs are placing bets on, on AI companies and AI tools, and now they're going to be using AI themselves. It's kind of coming full circle. You brought up Microsoft, and I think Microsoft is kind of the canary in the coal mine with the whole AI thing because of their investments with OpenAI and the fact that they have all of these other business units generating a ton of revenue. There's a world to me where Microsoft gives away a lot of this AI functionality for free and really erodes the price for the rest of the market, it makes it really, really hard for other companies to charge for this stuff. So it's going to be really interesting to see how that all pans out. For sure. The next cool thing that I've been checking out, IKEA is all in on drones. And apparently the company has about 100 autonomous inventory checking drones buzzing around its stores in Europe. The drones basically work when the stores are closed and fly around, scan inventory to make sure the stock is accurate and make sure the products are available for both online and physical purchase. And the real kicker here is that the drones are really good for their workers. So because the drones are doing this and kind of monitoring inventory in this way, their workers no longer have to manually confirm each pallet that gets delivered there and make sure that everything is in place because the drones are basically tracking this themselves. Well, I was going to say it's good that they're flying these drones around after hours because the last thing I want while looking for a <laughs> chair is a uh, drone zipping by my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, JC. So what is going on with Netflix's big bet on gaming? Yes. Yeah, so I think the best way to start this is just saying, when you think of Netflix, you think of TV and movies. And that alone is a massive market, massive opportunity. But when you kind of think ahead 10, 20 years down the road, for the company to continue growing, it's going to have to expand into some other verticals. And the last couple of years, we've seen Netflix really lay the groundwork for and start making some investments in what it's going to be its next major vertical, which is gaming. Gaming is far and away the largest category in the entertainment industry. Enormous. Last year, revenues were more than $170 billion globally. That's five times larger than the global movie box office. That is crazy. It is. It really is. And so you can see the demand there and the value and differentiation Netflix expects it will be able to offer customers by building a library of games and tossing the games into its offering for customers. Yeah, this is super interesting. And I think a lot of people were skeptical when Netflix announced that it was going to go into gaming. And a big question I think that was kind of on everybody's lips is like, well, what kind of games are they going to do? Can you shed a little light and context on what kind of games Netflix has launched so far? Yeah. So just stepping back a bit, since 2021, Netflix has made a series of gaming acquisitions. They've bought up gaming studios. They've also opened their own studios in Helsinki and in California. And yesterday, we actually got an update from the company's vice president of external games who explained that the company's gaming library now includes 55 games that includes new original games based on Netflix's IP and content, and as well as existing titles from other developers. And when I say based on Netflix's IP, I'm saying games based on shows that they make, things like Too Hot to Handle, where you have to do things like decide if you should chat up Theo, a tattooed musician, or <laughs> confident web designer Dakota. And that's one of Netflix's most played games. It's downloaded more than a million times so far. And the updates, by the way, also include that Netflix will be adding more than 40 games this year, and that there are 70 new games in development with gaming partners as well as 16 new games in development in-house. Crazy. So there's a lot going on. This is probably a dumb question, but what do you use to game on Netflix? Is there like a Netflix gaming controller? It's actually maybe one of the most important questions you could ask. It's actually kind of hard to play them. They're all mobile games for gotcha. now. Gotcha. So that means they're not available on laptops and TVs. You can browse these games on the Netflix mobile app, but you can't actually play them on the app. If you select one in the app, it links out to the game in the app store, and then you have to download it there and play it as a standalone app, which is really not a super ideal user experience. It'd be like going to Spotify and having to buy an audiobook, buy an audiobook <laughs> somewhere else. So exactly down the road, there's a high chance you'll be able to play all these games on the Netflix mobile app, on your TV, on your laptop. We've seen Amazon 
start to move into the cloud gaming space a bit. Yesterday, Microsoft announced plans to launch a gaming app store for iOS and Android, assuming its Activision Blizzard acquisition goes through. This all appears for Netflix to be in very early development, but I think the fact of the matter is, if anyone can do it well, it's probably the streamer that got 142 million households to watch people play squid games is there a squid game game in development i feel like that's a no-brainer oh if that's not already in existence i'm sure it is in development (laughs) yeah has to be has to be And bada bing, bada boom, that's going to do it for us today, folks. Thanks for tuning in to the Hustle Daily Show. We're proud part of the HubSpot Podcast Network. Our editor today is Robert Harwood. Our executive producer is Darren Clark. We've got a lot more tech and business coverage in our newsletter. If you're not subscribed, you can sign up at thehustle.co slash email. Hope you have an awesome Tuesday. Catch you tomorrow. Hey, I want to tell you about another podcast brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. This one is called My First Million, hosted by Sam Parr and Sean Purry. My First Million features famous guests like Alice Hermosi, Sophia Amoruso, and Hassan Minaj sharing their secrets for how they made their first million and how to apply their learnings to capitalize on today's business trends and opportunities. So for example, in a recent episode, Sean discusses how his former intern, went from making $30,000 a year to $40,000 in one minute by taking one big bet. And today, he's a 22-year-old millionaire, thanks to a couple early investments. Want to know more? You can listen to My First Million wherever you get your podcasts.